Mammoth. Some years ago, American newspapers announced the discovery of a well-preserved dinosaur in the state of Utah. It was stressed that the specimen had survived its kind and was millions of years younger than those previously known. Such pieces of news, like the repulsive humoristic craze for the Loch Ness Monster in the King Kong film, are collective projections of the monstrous total state. People prepare themselves for its terrors by familiarizing themselves with gigantic, with gigantic images. In its absurd readiness to accept these, impotently prostrate humanity tries desperately to assimilate to experience what defies all experience. But the imagining of primeval animals still living or only extinct for a few million years is not explained solely by these attempts. The desire for the presence of the most ancient is a hope that animal creation might survive the wrong that man has done it, if not man himself, and give rise to a better species, one that finally makes a success of life. Zoological gardens stem from the same hope. They are laid out on the pattern of Noah's Ark, for since their inception the bourgeois class has been waiting for the flood. The use of zoos for entertainment and instruction seems a thin pretext. They are allegories of the specimen or the pair who defy the disaster that befalls the species qua species. This is why the over-richly stocked zoos of large European cities seem like forms of decadence. More than two elephants, two giraffes, one hippopotamus are a bad sign. Nor can any good come of Hagenbach's layout. With, trench with trenches instead of cages, betraying the arc of simulating the rescue that only Ararat can promise. They deny the animal's freedom only the more completely by keeping the boundaries visible, invisible, the sight of which would inflame the longing for open spaces. They are to self-respecting zoos what, botan what botan botanical gardens are to palm courts. The more purely nature is preserved and transplanted by civilization, the more implacably it is dominated. We can now afford to encompass ever larger natural units and leave them apparently intact within our grasp, whereas previously the selecting and taming of particular items bore witness to the difficulty we still had in coping with nature. The tiger endlessly pacing back and forth in his cage reflects back negatively, through his bewilderment, something of humanity, but not the one frolicking behind the pit too wide to leap. The anticipated beauty of Brem's animal life stems from its way of describing animals as they are seen through the bars of a zoological garden, even and above all when quoting reports by fanciful explorers on life in the wilds. The fact, however, that animals really suffer more in cages than in the open range, that Hagenbach does in fact represent a step forward in humanity, reflects on the inescapability of imprisonment. It is a consequence of history. The zoological gardens in their authentic form are products of 19th century colonial imperialism. They flourished since the opening up of wild regions of Africa and Central Asia, which paid symbolic tribute in the shape of animals. The value of the tributes was measured by their exoticism, their inaccessibility, the development of technology has put an end to this and abolished the exotic. The farm-bred lion is as fully tamed as the horse, long since subjected to birth control. But the millennium has not dawned. Only in the irrationality of civilization itself, in the nooks and crannies of the cities, to which the walls, towers, and bastions of the zoos, wedged among them, are merely an addition, can nature be conserved. The rationalization of culture in opening its doors to nature thereby completely absorbs it and eliminates with difference the principle of culture, the possibility of reconciliation.